Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Akkad and Koka Report. Our guest today is Professor Stephen Sen, a world-renowned statistician whose career has spanned the gamut of activities that involves statistical analysis in medicine, from teaching to research to consultancy. Professor Sen obtained his PhD in statistics from the University of Dundee in Scotland and became a chartered statistician from the Royal Statistical Society in 1993. He has held professorships at University College London and at the University of Glasgow. He is the author of several books, notably Statistical Issues in Drug Development and Dicing with Death, Chance, Risk and Health. Professor Sen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure sure. to be here. We're delighted to have you uh, on the show. We had, um, we had wanted to, to invite you for quite a while, but we were waiting for an opportunity. And um, an opportunity came up a, few, um, a couple of weeks ago when the uh, New England Journal of Medicine published a trial. Um, and I'll have the trial, I have the link to the trial on the show notes um, about uh, the, the, um, the title of the trial is N of one trial of a statin, placebo or no treatment to assess side effects and uh, that was published a couple of weeks ago you commented on it on twitter and so we thought great maybe we'll have you on since uh, you've published on this kind of um, maybe not this particular trial design but but uh, certainly you've you've published well, you've you've published on everything but uh, but you have published on on out of one trials and crossover design trials and so forth this is a paper by francis wood and colleagues uh, from imperial college and um you know, for the audience, maybe I will describe uh, just briefly the, what, what the purpose of the trial was, uh, at least ostensibly. This is a very short paper. It's a letter, actually, uh, a letter to the uh, a correspondence part of the New England. So it, it's not um, um, very exhaustive, maybe a couple of pages. Um, I think it's well known, at least for the physicians in the audience, that um, uh, statins, um, well, first of all, uh, Patients frequently complain or of uh, effects from statins. Uh, yet in randomized clinical trials, uh, at least uh, in the aggregate, the, the number of side effects roughly is equivalent in the placebo arm and in the treatment arm. So we've all thought that, you know, if people complain of uh, especially subjective side effects of uh, aches and pains and, and, and whatnot from a statin, that you know we we we're, we're not sure i mean we we, we tend to to um, uh, to be a little bit skeptical of uh, attributing the um, the cause of the symptoms to to the statin but here the these um, investigators uh, what they did they did what what they claim to be an n of one trial uh, they took a bunch of patients maybe i think 60 patients in total and um, and those are patients who uh, in the past had or had been on a statin at some point in the past, but stopped taking it because of perceived side effects. So they invited them to, to give it another try. And over a period of a month, uh, of a year, they were each given four different bottles. Uh, I mean, three sets of, I'm sorry, three sets of four bottles. One set uh, of four bottles had statins in them for a one month supply, a one month supply. So, so, um, four one-month supply bottles of statins, four one-month supplies of placebo, and four empty bottles. And each patient was sort of randomized. There was some scheme to randomize the sequence by which they would take either the statin or the placebo that looked identical to the statin. They, they had the placebo made specifically to look identical to the otorvastatin, or not take anything at all, you know, if, if it was the empty bottle. And, um, and every month uh, they would have to, or every day actually, they, they would have to report uh, a symptom or, or their perception of whether they had a side effect uh, through an app on a smartphone. And so they would report, and it was really, they would report a score from zero to 100. 100, 100 being absolutely unbearable side effects and zero being no side effects whatsoever. So it was, it was not a matter of, I think, from the way I understand it, it was not a matter of describing exactly what kind of side effects they had, just, just to give a score, meaning a number of between zero and 100 of, of how they felt uh, the, the treatment was affecting them. And, um, and that was tallied, and, uh, and there was a, a team of statisticians to analyze the numbers. And, uh, and at the end of, of the whole thing, they discovered that, uh, yes, indeed, um, 
Um, if anything, there might be a little, what is called a nocebo effect of statins, meaning that um, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, compared to, well, actually, let, let, me not, let me not say anything at this point. Is this a fair description of the trial, uh, Professor, or uh, as far yeah, as you I, can? I, I think so. Um, it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a crossover trial, essentially. It's a within patient study, put it that way. So each, each patient gets to try each of the three treatments, and I think it was for four months for each. So they did very well to keep the patients uh, under observation for a whole year to do this. Mm -hmm. um, just a side story, and that is atorvastatin is a drug which has a particular interest for me because I was the statistician on the Data Safety Monitoring Board for the CARD study. Uh, this was a, a study for use of, of atorvastatin in um, diabetes, and it's the only time that I have stopped a study early for efficacy. So uh, I've been on oh, sequential great. studies where I've stopped, I've stopped studies because um, there were too many side effects or because it was obviously not working or whatever, but it's the only time I've actually been on a study which stopped early because of the, because of the efficacy. So, so it was actually study, wor working so well. It was working so well yeah, it was, that it, it worked, was right. worked yeah. so well that it, okay. uh, that it stopped early. Uh, funnily enough, another similar study running in America at the same time, this is running in Europe, uh, carried on to the end and the result was not significant. I don't know quite what we'll conclude from that but anyway. It's, uh, it's a sort of well, interesting study. Maybe but we'll anyway, talk about so, that. Uh, yeah, yeah, to return right. to this particular study, I think, I think it's uh, an interesting idea, very, very interesting results. Um, I like the idea of the design. I think it was an innovative design and well carried out. I hate the analysis. I think the analysis they did was, uh, was the initial one they proposed was was really not a good idea, but nevertheless, right. I think the results hold up, so. Okay, what, what I thought was very interesting is, I mean, I was very happy that they, um, they had a graph, a single graph in the paper that shows every single patient. And uh, on, on the x-axis, every single patient is, um, is numbered. And on the y-axis, they have, it's essentially a, a, a kind of a scattergram, uh, if you will. Uh, on, on top of corresponding to each patient, there are 12 <laughs> little bubbles uh, of three different colors, each color representing whether it's the no treatment score or the placebo score or the statin score. And, and that way you can visually see essentially the, the entire data set, which yeah, is... I think, that, I, I think that's, a, that's a nice idea. Uh, unfortunately, what they chose to do, I think, was they chose to, to represent the, um, the effectiveness of, uh, or the, the problem with atorvastatin, if there was one, by comparing um, to the difference between placebo and nothing at all. And the difficulty with that is you're dividing by a number which itself can be negative or positive and can, cr can cross zero. And division by such, such numbers will just effectively inject enormous variation into the results. And that's what they've found. And that's what any statistician could have told them. So I sort of wonder how did they right. manage to get, how did they manage to get that far in deciding how they were analyzing the trial and using such a terrible measure, which is very, very mysterious. Well, it, it, <laughs> so before, it, well, hold on, before, um, uh, the, before we get in, get into this excellent yeah, question sure, about how, sure. how you would, how you would analyze, you know, I'd love to hear how you would analyze the trial or, or what, what you would do. Um, the, the basis for the trial, um, the, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, we, as uh, Michelle talked about, yeah, you know, okay. we have we have large randomized control trials, um, and there's no difference in terms of stopping when you look at those trials, uh, placebo versus a statin. Why? Why? Yeah, why is so, that not enough, Doctor Sen? Well, I think why it's not enough for the following reason: somebody could always argue, oh well, in this particular trial, there were. No, no patients who would have the sort of typical problems that you would see with a torvastatin. And failing to find a difference then um, runs into a problem which is sometimes referred to as assay sensitivity. Ba people basically are saying, well, this trial would never be capable of finding a difference anyway. Now, in this particular study that they did, they can answer that question because they did find a difference. They found a difference between placebo and nothing at all. So they actually showed that the trial was capable of picking up differences. Uh, and in actual fact, they showed that yes, there is a nocebo effect. And then, you, then it becomes much more interesting. If you then fail to see much of an excess compared to a torvastatin, you may just think, ah, oh, well now hang on, 
if we had compared atorvastatin to nothing at all, we would still have found this difference, but we compared to placebo, we don't. So it becomes more convincing. So basically having a nothing at all arm uh, introduces this element of assay sensitivity. And by the way, it also um, was, uh, many other studies will claim there is a placebo effect without actually having had a control for placebo. So here you can quite clearly see there is a placebo effect, whereas with other studies, you might well say, well, it's just something that happens, or why should it be due to placebo, or whatever. So here's a placebo on the placebo effect. It's, so the design was very clever in that way. I like it. Is, is, the, is the fact that, uh, you know, statin trials are not, uh, you know, some small 5,000 patient trial in one village in uh, France or something, uh, the fact that you know they're ubiquitous and there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of patients um, that have been done since the 1980s, does that uh, lessen the uh, idea that there could be patients that are in these trials that are uh, that were that were missing? Well, I mean, to, to the extent that the statin trials have failed to show uh, an excess of side effects on statin compared to placebo, then I think that's sort of very interesting information to have. But it is the case that most clinical trials never recruit the sort of numbers that will be capable of picking up really set rare side effects. And so, of course, it's always possible that uh, in the community, the wider community, once statins are used in thousands and thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients, that some rare side effects we picked up. And of course, I think it was the, um, was it the Bayer drug, Bacol, which was the, the, the first one, which... Um, had this problem of rhabdomyolysis, I think, um, which has sort of led to statins being under a shadow since. I mean, I'm no uh, life scientist, so I don't really know the, the story behind that. And so there's a suspicion that may be there. But of course, failure to find a difference in clinical trials is important and should not be ignored. Very good. So let me um, uh, uh, more, more specifically uh, tell what their initial uh, primary outcome was, so their primary endpoint. Uh, the way they describe it. So, so it was, they took for, initially they were hoping to take for each patient the, um, um, the, the uh, symptom in intensity ratio, the nocebo, what they call the nocebo ratio, meaning for each patient, let's say Jim. <laughs> Jim, over the course of the one year, was at least, you know, was a third of the time on a placebo, a third of the time on a statin, and a third of the time on no treatment. And there was a score associated with each of these three uh, arms, so to speak, th three, three treatments. And so the ratio was the symptom intensity, so the, the score with placebo minus no treatment divided by the score with a statin minus the score with no treatment. Okay, mm -hmm. so the score of uh, placebo, uh, placebo minus no treatment divided by the score on a statin minus the score with no treatment. And as you said, there were a few patients who had a higher score <laughs> on no treatment than they did on either the placebo or, <laughs> or, gotcha. or the statin, right? Yeah. And I think, uh, I, I suspect, I mean, I was trying to, to think about that. Probably part of it is because what they had to report was really a score. Uh, just a, And I'm not sure. So that's not, it's neither in the paper itself nor in the supplement. I looked for yeah. it to see what the app was essentially or how it was phrased. That they, because if you wake up and you have, you stubbed your toe. Uh, do you report that just because as, as, a, as a symptom score or, or do you report what you think as a patient is attributable to? to the yeah, treatment? so I mean, I guess you would instruct them to report anything that they would feel they would report if they were taking a pill. But what, what, but, how come they so, reported something on no treatment at all? Well, so, I mean, the, right. the, the, imagine the following. Imagine you wake up uh, one day and you have uh, some ache in, uh, an ache in your lower leg. Yes. Right? Now, um, you're taking a pill and you think, oh, well, you know, that could be, it could be a tovastatin, might be placebo, but could be a tovastatin. I better report that. Now, if you don't report that when you don't take a pill at all, if you wake up one morning mm -hmm, when you're mm -hmm. not taking a pill and you have an ache and you don't report it, then, of course, you don't know whether um, the aches that right. you see when people are taking right. pills are really extra aches or not. So, if I were running the trial, I would instruct the patients, look, uh, we know it sounds silly, we know it sounds stupid, but nevertheless, report any malaise that you may okay. have, even though it's obviously not due to anything you're taking, anytime you have it. And so that's, that's the way you that would run sense. it. So it sounds as if they succeeded in doing right. that, and, uh, but they didn't actually 
think it through and think, well, maybe <laughs> we're actually going to get a few patients who have more. Just to say, a similar thing, I mean, I used to work in asthma a lot, and it's tempting to, to try and explain the treatment effect as a percentage of what's possible. And so patients come into asthma scores with a predicted uh, forced expiratory volume one, one second, or with a predicted lung function. And then they have a baseline lung function. And the baseline lung function is usually less than the predicted because they're suffering mm -hmm. from asthma and the predicted is for the general population or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's tempting to measure the benefit they get from a bronchodilator as a ratio of this difference between predicted, which one might assume is a sort of maximum possible, right. and the baseline value. Um, but unfortunately, it actually turns out that some, for some asthmatics, the baseline value is higher than the predicted right, value. Right. If you have a professional uh, swimmer who happens to yeah, write well, yeah. a super and so, lung capacity. And, and, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, and right. so, so what happens is you end up dividing by some, some very strange numbers. And it, has a, it sounds logical, but actually it has very, very bad properties. And you should never, ever construct such ratios. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> so so you'll tell us perhaps how you would have con constructed it, but they um, they were hoping initially to have uh, these these uh, these ratios, these nocebo ratios for each individual patient, and they came up with a number that really didn't make sense or at a very wide confidence interval, and so they ended up pooling uh, yeah. all the individuals and and giving a a score for on treatment with statin, a score for on treatment with placebo, and a score with uh, on, uh, no treatment, and and getting the uh, the nocebo effect uh, pooled that way, and they 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 came up with a value of uh, zero point nine, uh, nocebo ratio of zero point nine, which means that um, I'm trying to think through this. What does what does that mean? Uh, that means that there was I mean I mean essentially well, I mean, I that there was uh, yeah. Uh, um, uh, discomfort at the idea of taking a yeah. pill, essentially, right? Yeah, well, pe people love ratios, but I mean, quite apart <laughs> from the division by zero thing, ratios have really, really bad properties because uh, the distance from naught to one is the same as from one to infinity, uh, effectively. And uh, uh, they really are, they shouldn't be used in that particular way. I would either have stuck with the original scale and just looked at the difference, saying, look, this is the difference placebo to nothing. This is the difference atorvastatin to nothing. And the third difference is atorvastatin to placebo. And there are those three, right. three differences. And let's just talk about those rather than this obsession to somehow translate them into some index, some, some ratio or whatever. Or if you don't like that, then you could try transform the data. If, if the data are on a scale naught to 100, that's a bounded scale. And one, one possibility is to use a so-called logit transformation or an arc sine transformation or something to try and make the scale behave better. But it may probably wouldn't be necessary to do that. So I just, I just think it was a lot of complication for no good purpose, basically, uh, which had the effect of messing things up. Okay. Uh, they consulted a statistician who they, did a sort of band-aid right. band job on it. But, right. They said, and not only an, an independent statistician, they, they, they yeah, specified. Yeah, that, that, right. that's good. <laughs> but but you, know, you know the quote by, quote by R.A. Fish, you know, which is when he says, to call in the statistician after the experiment is finished may be to do no more than to ask him to perform a post-mortem. He can say what the experiment died of. <laughs> <laughs> well, well he, here the patient survived. He managed to, the statistician, she or right. she, I think it probably was, man, managed to, to rescue, the, rescue the trial um, from, uh, from the death throes into which the analysis had put it. But right. It, well, you know, perhaps later in the conversation, we'll, we'll talk more generally about the, the, the interface between statisticians and physicians. Um, but, but here, so you, you, as you said earlier, you said that this, the title of the paper is N of one trial, but you think you think it's not really an N of one trial, um, and and the the um, well, I, the, the, I would, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it doesn't really matter. It is what it is. It's an interesting okay. trial. It's an interesting design. It's a valid design. Um, I would have called it a crossover trial or with inpatient study. I think the idea of an N of one trial is replication of the individual treatments at the level of patients. Mm -hmm. And so had, for example, they used, but it would have been difficult, had they used a two-year study with um, six periods of four months, and then the patient randomly has two of these 
two of these periods under a torvastat in two and a placebo and two and nothing at all, then that would have been what I would have called an N of one study. But with just one replication for each treatment, I don't think that's quite classic N of one study. But in the end, it doesn't matter. You know, it's just, uh, these are just names. Um, the, the, date, the data are there and it's an interesting design. So, you know, it's not particularly important, but Okay. People are trawling the literature for N of one studies. They'll be slightly surprised to come across this one. That's so. <laughs> the um, so there, there's there's a um, clearly a, and you you've actually um, expanded on this well. I mean, um, in in uh, in a nice post on uh, the various different, generally speaking, the various different trials that exist, and and the different um, uh, disadvantages of the various trials, um, and so you know the classic randomized control trial that we think of as, as the parallel group trial. And that really um, doesn't take into account a number of different errors. Um, you know, you've, the, the between patient error, you know, patient by treatment interaction, and then of course, within patients as well. So uh, is, is um, this is a more general question, but uh, should we, should we be, what, what's the barrier to doing more, you know, oh. trials that are, that, that are better. You've described, again, this is again in your post that we'll link in the show notes, you know, parallel group trial, a classical crossover trial. And that's what you think this is. This is more of a crossover trial, correct? Um, yeah, and then, I would think, and then, I would think so. Yeah. And then your they final... Don't give us, yeah, they don't actually they, give us the sequences. Right, um, right, right. So there are, six, there are six possible sequences. Right. And I don't think even the, in the supplementary material, I was just looking at it again, but I was having a quick they tell us exactly what the sequences use. They might've used a subset of three sequences rather than the six. Uh, and whether they attempted to randomize in equal numbers to the six sequences, if they use six. And, uh, I don't think that detail is given, but I assume something like that was done. So the, the repeated period crossover trial, then that would be an N of one. That would be N of one. That, that right. would be N of one from a different perspective. And yeah, if, if you, I mean, I think that people have jumped on the personalized a medicine bandwagon without really realizing that most clinical trials cannot tell you what proportion of patients respond for the simple reason that basically um, they're parallel group trials. And so every patient only receives one of the treatments being compared. And we would have to know what they would have shown on the other treatment to know whether a given treatment made a difference for them or not. Uh, and instead we sort of, we sort of create these arbitrary responder respond to categories um, but we don't really know whether they were causal or not right you have uh, i think a lot of a lot of uh, the sort of hype on personalized medicine is based on misunderstanding this point basically and so and, and you and you would say that you you can't really i mean it, it, that, that information is is you can't glean from the most common trial we do right now which is parallel group randomized, randomized control trials you can't glean no that type of information with difficulty. I mean, basically what you're taught as a statistician is that to identify interactions, which is to say um, treatment effect varying according to whom it's given to, you need replication at the level at which you claim the interaction. So we can, we can uh, divide patients into groups. We can, for example, st study whether the treatment effect is different for men than for women. We, we, we could do that. But to do it at the level of the patient, you have to have replication at the level of the patient. There are some possible tricks otherwise. If you find that the standard deviation is much bigger in the treatment group than the placebo group, it might be an indication that some patients are benefiting and others aren't, which tends to sort of stretch the, st stretch the variation in the group. Um, but when people have looked at this, they've found it very, very difficult to find much evidence for um, individual response. So this idea of the idea that we, the casual language that we use um, of uh, responders versus non-responders, um, yeah. is that is that that's that you would characterize that as as somewhat lazy uh, and and you can't. Yeah. I mean, there's no way of really knowing. So it's possible. I guess it's it's possible statistically. There's no way of knowing it. If you're a physician that has some understanding of physiology or or, or you know some basic science or whatever. So there's some prior that's built on something that makes it likely, but that should be, of course, identified prior, right? Not, not after the trial is done. Yeah, but I mean, even, even so, you know, you have to be very, very careful. I mean, it might well yeah. be that 
it's useful. I don't think it usually is, but it could be that it's sometimes useful to classify patients in a binary way, responder, non-responder. Right. Although you so, use, it, use a lot of information. But the trouble is, you then think that that word means something. The word doesn't mean anything causally. Mm. If you have so, one subject who has a 10 millimeter improvement in, in blood pressure, yeah. and another and as a responder, another one is nine millimeters, the non-responder, measure them on another occasion, and they change mm. places. So it's, it's ludicrous to, to say, oh, 70% responded in the trial, therefore it didn't work for 30%. That's just ridiculous. Right, right. So, but is it, is it unfair, of, and I'm sorry to, 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 to harp on this, because this, this, as, as a physician, you know, we'll see these waterfalls plot, uh, waterfall plots, right? So where you have, uh, you have these, lar I, I'm, I'm thinking of the ones for cancer at the moment, but, but you can make them for other things, uh, where you have these large, you know, incredible responses from the tumor on one end, and on the other end, you know, these patients that the tumor actually gets bigger or, or doesn't. You don't think it's reasonable to say that clearly there's something that we don't understand that makes some people responders and others people, other people not. Can you, can you kind of clarify why that's, that's lazy and we shouldn't be doing that as physicians? Well, the first thing is that um, it could well be, for example, that a patient who shows a modest increase in tumor size and is therefore not considered to have responded would have had a much, much bigger increase in tumor size during the period of treatment had they not been given treatment. Secondly, it's possible also that patients could have a reduction in tumor size because in many cancer trials, you'll find that many things are being done to patients at the same time. Um, and therefore, a patient in uh, the treatment, a treatment arm could have a reduction in tumor size, but it's not necessarily due to the particular different agent in that arm to the other arm. It could be that all patients are having some sort of reduction because of other things that are going on. Um, so one has to be very, very careful in assuming that one can imply causality at the individual level. It's a label, but the label responder, non-responder tempts people into thinking that it's due to the treatment. And that is a big leap. It's not necessarily the right. case. So response at the individual level is very important for clinicians. It's very important, obviously, for patients as well. Um, now, there are people who claim that, I mean, there was a lot of enthusiasm precisely for, I mean, you know, for N of 1 trials uh, in general uh, since the 1980s. Uh, I'll have a paper, uh, a review by uh, Richard uh, Kravitz and, and colleagues in 2008 Mm -hmm. um, that outlines the history of this uh, end of one trial movement and its ups and downs and sort of lamenting that it hasn't been embraced as much as it, as it should be. What are your thoughts? I mean, in general, if, if you had a magic wand and, you know, you could have investigators uh, use a kind of trial design more, so, more than others, do you think that it's, um, uh, is that a, uh, a fair assessment that it's they're underutilized that they could be utilized more for the benefit of, of patients and clinicians no i think they could be but obviously um one has to be talking about uh, essentially um uh, stable chronic disease right right so than, so not not all uh, conditions disease. are, are no, not all right. not all conditions right. are suitable for it that's that's point number yeah. one um secondly they are quite demanding of time on by the patient mm -hmm. Um, but the, I think there are some areas where pharma companies could have been more ambitious um, and use them as a sort of phase four trials. You know, once the drug's developed, let's see if we can now say something more about variation. And it might well be that they would then have discovered, well, you know, actually the individual effect is not so great. But if they then discover it's great, then they might think about how they can optimize the use of their drug. Can, right. Can Although, I mean, identify, you know. wouldn't it be a, 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 an almost uh, an obvious loss for, for a pharmaceutical company to, to get that information at the individual level? I mean, are they <laughs> immediately going to lose a fair share of, of the market? Uh, yeah, I, I, that's, that's interesting. I mean, it's, uh, you know, from one point of view, I mean, I, I don't know. I, as I say, I'm no life scientist, but I always find it rather odd that so many drugs are given in the same doses for women and for men. Right. Uh, and I sort of assume that that means that on average, women are at greater risk of a side effects 
and on average, when men are at greater risk of loss of efficacy, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. some compromise between the two is being used. Of course, there are exceptions. There'll be some some women who are much much bigger than a very small man or whatever, and there are other other right. things to do with distribution as well, and you know, fat concentration and so forth. But nevertheless, that's what I sort of feel. And yet, the pharma companies have been incredibly reluctant to have uh, dosing by by sex. And there's a friend, a, a colleague of mine who once asked, um, occasionally do it, who once asked uh, why he was given, being given 50% more for a malaria drug uh, traveling with his, with his wife uh, than his wife. And uh, the doctor said, well, it's different dose for men and women. And he said, yes, but why? You know, sort of uh -huh. want to know why. And he said, well, uh, because men are bigger. Well, he's exactly the same weight as his wife. You know, so, <laughs> so, so, so of course, you know, what, whatever, whatever rules we use, there's, there's, there's a benefit of simplicity in a way because it makes it easier. Right. Uh, I've taught medical so, students, most are, most are quite good at math, but some can't understand decimal points. It's quite frightening. So, you know, you know we, have to, we have to think about the dangers of, of, of getting calculation as well involved. So, so maybe a simple story is better, but then what I want to know is why the enthusiasm for personalized medicine? You know, why, how can these two, two different uh, views of the marketing men uh, survive in the same world. It seems very strange. It, it is interesting because, uh, you know, this, these um, end of one trials, they are as much a clinical endeavor, it seems, than they are a research endeavor. Because at the end of the day, if you have a, an end of one trial with 50 patients, you have 50 answers, right, individually. I mean, it, perhaps. Perhaps, so, yes, so, maybe. I mean, <laughs> th there's a desire to come up with a general, right, to do research yeah, in yeah. order to come up with a general rule, yeah. a general finding. But at the same time, there's a desire to, to tell Bob and Susan, you know, this works for you and this doesn't work for you or, or you know, individually. And so in, in the paper by, by Kravitz, he, he talks about uh, that at some point, at least some academic centers had set up a, an N of one trial unit where a, a clinician could refer a patient and could say, here, Susan, go to the N of one trial unit. They'll set you up. They'll figure out whether this medication works for you or gives you, you know, or if it's, because, and then they would have all, you know, they would run the patient through, try to make it a little more efficient. Um, and I, I thought that was kind of interesting because uh, precisely because it's, it's, it's almost no longer a, a research endeavor in terms of uh, uh, finding. Now, on the other hand, you could pull uh, the results from N of one and come up with some kind of general statements about the treatment. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, that's uh, I was going to ask you, um, how, how should we, uh, how, what is the best way to discuss rates of response? Meaning, you know, they're all, <laughs> I know you're, you've, uh, you've been uh, front and center in terms of the charge against, I don't, I don't want to say against, but the charge to, to talk about NNT, for instance, number needed to treat, right? Mm. The, what, how, do, how should we discuss uh, what the rate of response for trial? You see the Samson trial investigators struggling <laughs> to come up with some, something to talk about the fact, you know, uh, to quantify this nocebo ratio yeah. or whatnot. Well, and in some I, cases, that, that, that's kind of like, that's a little bit of the, the difficulty that they ran into, as opposed to just visually showing the graph and letting yeah. folks try to come to their mind. How, how should, is there a way that you think that we should better be able to talk about rates well, of they, response? They, um, they said they use various mixed models um, right. to analyze the data. And basically that's how you should analyze N of one trials. Um, because um, although if you had an infinity of information from a particular patient, you would only use the information for him or her since the information is finite, uh, you will in fact gain something funnily enough by mixing the information that you have for them with the information you have for others. Um, uh, and this is the well-known shrinkage property of, uh, of uh, mixed models. They will predict something which is some way between uh, the, the result that you showed yourself and the result that the average showed. And this may seem odd, but in actual fact, we all have bad days. Mm -hmm. And so the people with the most extreme results probably really in the long run won't have results quite as extreme as that, uh, extremely good or extremely bad. And so you actually, funnily enough, you tend to do better in prediction by mixing them with the results from others. And this can be handled formally using mixed models and that should be used more, I think, for, for analyzing these sort of the data. 
it, otherwise, the, I wouldn't complicate the story by, you know. Right. right. Is the issue, Dr. Sen, that we are attempting to uh, uh, quantify? Uh, maybe George, is, is it enough to say that, uh, just as an, as an example, um, you, you for some reason uh, enjoy headache examples in a lot of the stuff that you write about. <laughs> I, noticed, I don't know if you suffer from I, headaches. I know, I don't. I don't. My, my, my daughter, I think, gets migraine uh, quite badly, poor thing. Um, so, and maybe tension headaches also, I don't know, but I, I'm being <laughs> blessed that way. Uh, I've occasionally complained about my, uh, my digestive system, but actually the, the headaches, a touch wood. <laughs> I've, but in some... Uh, good, so. So, 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 Jay, so say in some, um, just to particularize it, in some, in some large trial that's done, 30% of patients that are treated with uh, drug X for headaches uh, show, you know, based on some scale, show, show an improvement. And, uh, um, uh, no, sorry, 30% in, in, you know, in the placebo arm and say 50% in the headache, uh, in the new pill that, is, uh, that, you, that you've come up with. Um, do, can, is it enough to say that, look, I think this pill is going to help your headache, your headache uh, you know, and why don't we try it and see what happens? Or, or, or do, we need to, do we need to quantify that and say, well, it's 30% here and the placebo, 50% reduction. So that's a 20%, 20 difference. And therefore you're, you know, then you come, somebody will, some ER physician will come up with a number needed to treat uh, uh, number. Yeah. Is, is, are we running into an issue so, because of? Yeah. So the, num the number needed to treat for paracetamol and versus placebo in tension headache is supposed to be 10, I think. <laughs> right. right. And, and this is based from memory. I think this is based upon 59% uh, response in paracetamol and 49% in placebo. So basically, Right. The idea is that only the ten percent benefited, but actually that's not true. And and I was able to show with a simple model that if you had an exponential distribution for the duration of headache, um, but this is an oversimplification, but just to show that for all we know it's true, um, and you could reduce the uh, the average time uh, on uh, on this 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 random process, this is exactly what you would see. So it's quite possible for the data that Cochrane had used, they'd, they'd had six, I think it was 6,000 patients. Uh, it's quite possible that every single patient in the meta-analysis had had a benefit of about 25% reduction in duration of headache. So how does a 25% translate into this 10% benefit? The answer is that if your headache improves after two hours and one minute, you didn't respond. If it improves after one hour and 59 minutes, you did respond. So you simply flip people from responder into non-responder, depending upon how long their, their headache lasted. And if you imagine someone whose headache lasts, you know, usually lasts two and a half hours with paracetamol, sometimes three hours, sometimes two hours. If it was just over two hours, the paracetamol would reduce him to be a responder. If it was three hours, it wouldn't. And you then think that's a fundamental difference between patients, but it's just the same patient on a given occasion we classified as a responder or a non-responder. So it's just over, in, over interpretation of data like that. And that's where the end of one trials come in. If what they had done was tried people several times under placebo, several times under paracetamol, then they would be able to answer what proportion benefited. Right. So these arbitrary but, dichotomies, you know, you lose yeah, information. They, 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 they just, they just, they just switch things like that. And, and as I say, I've got a, I've got a spreadsheet on my website. You can type in your own values and it will just, uh, it's quite amusing. I think it's amusing, but you know, I'm a statistician. <laughs> <laughs> it, it will simulate some of these examples for you. And actually what happens is that every single headache is improved under paracetamol compared to placebo, but because it's a parallel group trial, you only get to see one of the answers. And because you, you either get to see the placebo one, or you get to see the paracetamol one, and it will just produce in the simulation, it produce exactly what the Cochrane saw. But if you go back and you look at the, the counterfactual answer and the real answer, you'll find that every single patient has got a benefit by the same proportion. Um, and you can put in whatever particular uh, disease you, you're thinking of. So, so people write utter garbage nonsense based on NNTs, you know, it's... Right. Now, in, in, in these, you know, talk about either headaches or statin uh, adverse effects and whatnot, I mean, these are purely subjective uh, symptoms, right? I mean, there, there's no, you can't get in the head of somebody, of, of your patient and determine, yes, yeah. 
you, you, <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> you thought you had a headache, but you don't. So, um, so for those at the end of the day, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, say you run this end of one trial on the statin adverse effect and, and the patient had a higher score on, you know, a higher symptom score on placebo than on, they're still not going to want to take this, right? They're not going to want to, I mean, I, I don't know. If I were a patient like this, I would say, okay, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> I don't care what your statistics showed, but at the end of the day, I, uh, I'm going to do what. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, you know, the people can have, uh, it's, it's right that, that uh, individuals can make that decision, but I think it's useful for us as a society as a whole um, in the story that we tell, I mean, you know, if we're going to right. label particular drugs as causing side effects or not, that we're very, very careful about what we say, because there is a distinction between you might have such and such an event if you take this drug to saying that you wouldn't have this event if you don't take this drug and it would definitely be caused by the drug if you do have the event. That's not necessarily true. Right, um, right. The, the, the you know, uh, things happen in everybody's life anyway. And uh, treatments, you know, I mean, uh, some of the stories are ridiculous. When Viagra was first sold, uh, some, the big issue, which is a sort of the, the, the people who are unemployed and on the street sell this, had quite a nice story, but they said uh, 28 people have died who took Viagra uh, why isn't the government doing something about it? And mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, how many people have died who read the big issue? Why aren't you doing something about it? You know? I mean, su subsequence is not consequence. Sure. So we, we do need to think about alternatives. And it's a patient's good right to say, well, I don't, I don't like this story and I don't want to listen to it. That's fine. We have to be very, very careful about what we as scientists then purvey as being the general information. It's, um, you know, it, it's interesting because part of the problem may have to do with the democratization of, of scientific knowledge in a way. I mean, why is there a nocebo effect with statin if not for the fact that we tell patients, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, I, I assume, I don't know for a fact, but I assume that perhaps part of this has to do with whatever brouhaha has you know, uh, about statins took place in the 1980s and, and 90s about what potential, I mean, you know, we're priming, you know, patients with certain information. And, and if we had not primed them with that information, perhaps, you know, they, they'd be less susceptible to, to the nocebo effect. Uh, and, and so here we're trying to correct for something that was <laughs> sort of generated by, uh, by this dissemination of information. Um, yeah, which is, I mean, it's, it's the way it is, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, one has to be careful. Right. This particular small trial showed yeah. that um, it was quite plausible that people could, in fact, imagine that they had side effects from statin, <clears throat> but it was imagination because they were getting the same result on placebo. Mm -hmm. But it's a small trial. There are only 60 patients involved. It's a fantastic effort to do something like this. For a really rare, serious side effect, you wouldn't see that in this particular trial. Right. So if, if, there were a, if there was a rare, serious side effect due to statins, you simply wouldn't see it in this trial. And you couldn't take this trial as being proof that this would not happen. But nevertheless, it's a very interesting result. It shows that there is a psychological element to all of this, which we should be careful about. Indeed. You, so, you, go ahead. You, go ahead. You, uh, there, your, um, you know, your, uh, the, the, this idea of subsequence, not consequence. Again, I urge... Anyone, everyone who's listening to uh, to read uh, <laughs> to read what you've written. I mean, I think you're. It's really uh, remarkable um, how well it is you put your thoughts to paper and clarify for, oh, for folks. You. So really uh, wonderful. I, I, I've read. I've lost count of how many papers of yours read. But in, in you know you have a little tight uh, in, in a nature paper. You have a little section that I thought was was really great where you talk about subsequence not consequence, and you say that. Um, all of the errors discussed so far lead to the assumption that what has happened for good or ill has been caused by what was done before, that if a headache disappeared, it was because of the drug. And then you go mm -hmm. on to say that it's ironic, and you're talking, this is a paper, you're talking about uh, personalized uh, medicine and some of the mistakes that folks are making when uh, discussing personalized uh, medicine. You go on to say that it's ironic that the evidence-based medicine movement, which has done so much to enthrone the randomized clinical trial as a principled and cautious way of establishing causation across populations, consistently fails to establish causation in the context of personalized medicine. Uh, 
do you do you, do you think that um, there's a path uh, you know the path to causation um, we discussed the fact that randomized control trials may struggle with that because of the various you know errors uh, that, that can crop up so the question is you know what is can you actually get to causation via statistical uh, analysis or does it require something uh, does it require something more well i would think via um carefully designed experiments you you can um but one has to be careful a uh, causal analysis is always about what happened to the patients in the trial and of course what we would like to be able to do is to say what will predict what will happen to patients in future that requires further modeling further assumptions and is inherently uh, much more unsure and safe um, and so we we have to be careful about that but i think in the end we reach a situation in which we simply say well it's possible that all of these objections one of these objections might be true but we have to ask ourselves whether the resources are best placed by answering all of these further questions when in actual fact other drugs are waiting to be developed and other diseases are waiting for waiting to be treated and so we just have to accept that there's a limit to to what we can do and and be realistic in that way but we also should be careful i mean i just want to say some wonderful things have been done in personalized medicine but i just think that the scope for it has been vastly vastly overstated and there's been a loss in ambition and i think in my own lifetime you know what was for me one of the things that was astonishing was the the story of treating ulcers in which had several elements. Uh, first of all, uh, tagamet and cimetidine, you know, and, and then the, uh, the proton pump inhibitors and at the same time, um, the discovery that H. pylori was an infectious agent and then uh, the development of a very simple way to test for H. pylori and the development of suitable antibiotics to deal with it. And that essentially wiped out surgery for ulcers. And that was a terrific medical uh, revolution, but it has very little, okay, you're testing for H. pylori, but basically there's very little personalization about it. Uh, you can just start people on the meprazole straight away or, you know, whatever. Right. Low sec, if, you, if, you, if, if they've got the symptoms and you're already doing more than, you know, decades and centuries of, of physicians have been able to do for their patients. And instead now what we're doing is we're spending huge sums of money to try and find drugs that work for virtually nobody. You know, which is a sort of pretty, pretty weird program to be engaged on. It's interesting, but that's uh, that you bring up that point. I think you're absolutely correct. But um, one could say that uh, the successes that uh, infectious diseases, in particular, have had is precisely because of the fact that there is we we can sort of immediately um, understand the causation of a bacterial or or an infectious agent, right? Whereas most of the other, you know, many, uh, most of the other conditions, it's murky. Coronary disease, atherosclerosis, all yeah. these inflammatory disorders and whatnot. You know, we don't know what, uh, you know, it, it's sort of, a, it, it's, um, it, it's the animal spirits that, uh, that are at play here. And it's yeah. much, much harder to, uh, to, to tease yeah, out. And, and, and it's obvious. And, you know, I mean, I would be the first to, to admit that, um, of course, diagnosis has always been an important part of medicine and diseases which we would have lumped together at one time, you know, probably uh, tuberculosis and pneumonia mm -hmm. and, you know, various uh, diseases of the lung would have been classified as being the same thing um, in, in the 19th century, that that, that is, has always been important. So there's an element of personalization, which, is, which has always happened. And I'm not arguing about that. I'm just saying that we should be much more hard headed about the way in which we, we judge this. All right. Professor, in the last um, few minutes that we have, uh, maybe we can even step back a little further uh, away from clinical trial des design. And um, let me throw an observation um, at you. Um, I, th I think uh, in the 1960s, two very important things happened to doctors. Uh, number one, they were told, um, and, and, and I think perhaps for, for good reason, that they couldn't um, rely on their moral sense. They needed bio things called, they needed the help, the assistance of bioethicists. Ethicists. Uh, number one, that's the one thing. And the second thing that happened also around the same time is that they couldn't 
uh, rely on their intuitions about causation and so forth, but they needed statisticians. So ethicists and statisticians um, emerged in the 1960s and 70s as a sort of uh, uh, aids for the clinicians. And we hear a lot about um, uh, encouraging doctors to think statistically. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Do you think that um, uh, doctors in general are statistically deficient and, and there's a bit of, um, uh, it, it's a necessary uh, corrective to our innate uh, biases? Uh, uh, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so at all. In fact, you mentioned my book, Dicing with Death, and part of what I discovered in writing the book and researching the history of, of medical statistics was precisely how many people who've been trained as physicians um, contributed to medical statistics. And a good example is Ross. Uh, the, so the, the chap who won the Nobel Prize for identifying the, uh, the cause of malaria. Um, he was actually obsessed by mathematics, and it was said unkindly by his... Uh, by his colleagues that he'd far more see an equation than a patient, you know. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but he was actually one of the first people to, to propose um, differential equations as being a way of describing the way in which epidemics could, could grow. Um, so I, th I think there have been cases uh, right around, there are many people on Twitter at the moment who are medically qualified, who are, uh, you know, really very, very hot in statistics. So I don't, I don't take that particular point of view. And I also don't take the point of view that um, statistics can substitute for medicine. Um, there's a certain type of statistical analysis which I describe as being a dream in which mathematics triumphs over biology. You know, people think that by doing complicated things, they can, uh, they can do better than this. Right. Or to put it another way, if, if, it's, if the call goes out on a transatlantic flight, is there a doctor on the plane? A PhD in statistics does not need to stand up. That's basically... <laughs> but in, in a way, statistics... Uh, right. In a way, statistics allows us uh, to visualize... I mean, I, I don't know if visualize is the right word, but maybe to, to visualize our, our reasoning errors, or at least to, to quantify them or to put them on a... Yeah. Um, uh, and 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 you know to be more mindful of our biases, but but perhaps we can be mindful of our biases just by being mindful about them with um, you know simple aphorisms or yeah. things like that. Or <laughs> no, I, well, I, I no, I, I think there's a I think collaboration is, is good, um, mm -hmm. and I think uh, I can't claim I've been one of the best uh, medical statisticians for collaborating, but I have tried to put a lot of effort into explaining statistics. So that people can can understand, understand the issues, and I think I think there are there are many many simple things that we could uh, improve. Concurrent control. Did you see all the fuss about the uh, AstraZeneca um, uh, trial, vaccine. The, the vaccine this week? So no. my big question, my big question there is, if we have got some low dose patients and some high dose patients, and the low dose was low dose by accident, which is mm -hmm. one of the stories circulating, may or may not be true. I don't know. Mm -hmm then are they concurrent? Because if they're not concurrent, then how can we compare rates? Right. You could claim for, the for epidemic the, changed the or right. The epidemic changed or everything. Right. Right. Yeah. So I, it seems to me unlikely that they were concurrent. Now you can try and fix that. With, I have a blog up at the moment explaining how you could try and fix that, but there's a penalty. And what you'll find is that, you know, what may seem like a large number of patients is effectively equivalent to a rather smaller number. So, you know, the, so, so the, even in the age of, of COVID, there are things that we continue to forget about statistics. We should be very, very careful. Dr. Zen, can I ask you, um, in, in, in the, the, the overtime that we have, um, <laughs> the FDA um, yeah. and uh, its role in uh, regulating what works and what doesn't work, um, do, you have any, is there any, do you have any pause to, to the role of the FDA in 2020, say? I mean, you know, there's this idea that um, there shouldn't be political, in, a political influence brought to bear on the FDA. So take vaccines as an example. Um, is it, is it, uh, how, 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 how should one manage this? Clearly, there's a huge demand from society and, and many physicians for, say, a vaccine to roll out, you know, yesterday um, to our highest risk patients. Um, is it unreasonable for uh, uh, folks to, is it reasonable for number one, the FDA to be, should the FDA have this role to say, okay, yes, you know, here's the data, here's the study, you know, a physician, uh, physicians, statisticians, uh, 
you know, the community reads it. We want, we want the vaccine. We've decided that the safety profile is, is acceptable for this group of people. What does the FDA have to say beyond that? And then number two, if, okay, fine. We have this FDA that, that is, is, is kind of this, this wall that's saying yes or no. And, uh, you know, the, there's apparently multiple uh, airlines that are, that are, you know, have jets fueled uh, waiting for the FDA approval to, <laughs> to, to come over. Um, but is it, is it not our role as, uh, as, as citizen study to kind of try to push the FDA to, to, to do something? Well, um, so sample size calculations usually don't take costs into account, but basically sample size calculations ought to be about the value of information. Uh, to, to what extent is it a good idea to carry on um, uh, studying things longer um, how much gain do we get by studying things longer be compared to acting? And it's clear that this has to be taken into account. So you can't have one rule to say that, you know, that you always have to go through all of these hoops. When you're in the middle of a pandemic, you might possibly have different standards. So it's possible we're going to have different standards. However, I would be very nervous about handing that decision over to anybody else other than the FDA. Because it seems to me that you know we, we, we love to hate the FDA, but nevertheless they have uh, a lot of um, you know dedicated uh, professionals who are used to doing this sort of review thing. Um, society might give them a few pointers, saying, "Well, you know, there are a few things to consider here." But nevertheless, I would not be in favor of taking that role away from them. <clears throat> does the FDA have its Does the FDA have its own incentives? Um, meaning that 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 may that may limit them just like physicians have biases um, yeah the fda for instance you know the fda has been somewhat of a political it's by nature political because it's it is you know because of where it stands and of yeah. course the biggest problem for the fda uh, would be allowing something to come out that then results in some adverse events to happen because then of course it, it, you know everyone would look to the fda so are they perhaps the right people to be deciding this because their bias is 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 one of one of safety, which is understandable, yes, but it's one bias. That, that's true, and I agree that it's it is the case that uh, regulators will uh, rarely this may be an exception at the moment they will rarely be criticised for um, failing to let a drug onto the market, right? Because the drug will be forgotten and the story will be forgotten. They run a much bigger risk in allowing something on the market, which subsequently turns out to be a dud or dangerous in some particular way. So that means that they, they do tend to act in a conservative way. One can argue as to whether that's good or whether that's bad. So that, that, that's, a, that's a possible bias I accept. But nevertheless, I feel that other actors in this particular game have right. biases in other directions, which are even worse and so I tend to take the point of view, better the devil we know. I have a solution. I have a solution to that. Um, I forgot to, I forgot to, when I introduced to uh, Professor Sen, I forgot to mention, or I didn't mention to the audience that you're origi you are originally from Switzerland. Yeah. And as a Swiss statistician, <laughs> you're probably, you know, the, you're the ultimately, ultimate neutral uh, um, arbiter of, uh, of data. And perhaps... Um, the decision, instead of being in the hands of the FDA, should be in the hands of Swiss statisticians, <laughs> neutral Swiss statisticians who can <laughs> decide for the United States whether the vaccine should be approved or not. <laughs> well, I mean, actually, unfortunately, Switzerland seems to be beating all the records for the number of people who are catching uh, COVID infection. So oh, no. although okay. Switzerland usually manages to organize things very, very well, they have not done well in the pandemic, possibly because the devolved decision-making model of the Switzerland, which works extremely well under most circumstances, doesn't work particularly well precisely when there is a national emergency of this particular sort. So too much has been left, I think, in the individual cantons to decide. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Although, so, you know, you, you, could, you could sample, you could uh, take different countries based on their <laughs> more or less authoritarian uh, uh, political systems. Yeah, and, and possibly. possibly. I, I don't know. It's uh, difficult, to, difficult to say or yeah. to see. Also, I have to say that the Swiss, although the Swiss healthcare system is generally praised as being rather good, it's also extremely expensive. I think it's the, the second most expensive after the American model. Right. So. right. Yeah. All right. Professor Sen, that was uh, just a wonderful, wonderful uh, conversation. Uh, we thank you very much. Where can uh, oh, people follow you? you? Right. Can you, can you give us your Twitter handle? Uh, 
Oh gosh! It'll, it'll, if you don't, uh, it, that, it'll be on the it'll I, be on the website. It'll be on the show I notes. Always, always forget. Um, now let me see. <laughs> so, what exactly is my uh, is my Twitter handle? I think it's it's at, it's at Stephen Sen. So with yes. Stephen with a PH and Sen with two Ns. So S-E-N-N, at Steve, S-E-N-N. S-E-N-N. And your website, I think, is uh, uh, S-E-N-N-S dot U-K. S-E-N-N-S. Dot UK. Dot I think UK. that's your. That's right. Yeah. Your, your Sends, website. Sends. Right. Yeah, that's right. We'll have those on the show notes, including links to your to your books and and paper and. Oh, that's uh, kind. Thank you. So thank you very much. No, thanks. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye.